waiting, waiting. Okay, so that's us going live this morning. Hello and welcome to the Harassis Extraordinary Meeting 2020 and our speakers panel, Balancing Long and Short Termism. In the Harvard Law School and World Economic Forum white paper from June 2019 on this topic entitled The Modern Dilemma, it asks a range of questions, including is quarterly reporting the enemy of long termism and what are the drivers for long term value? For many grassroots communities around the globe striving to survive each day, this balance is a matter of life and death. And so social issues are one of the aspects that global leaders are proactively responding to. In this morning's session, we will also touch on climate, environment and sustainability, leadership and communication, financial investment and reporting and technology. So a very packed session ahead. My name is Angela Watt and I am the Resonate Together, a community enterprise back manager Central Scotland and Resonate vigorously drives a whole system approach that enables every citizen to flourish. So this balance that we need to find is of great importance for our community to thrive. I am also on the board of two national organisations, Social Enterprise Scotland and ACOSVO, which is the Association of Chief Officers of the Scottish Voluntary Organisations. And I will be chairing this panel session. I'd like to introduce my fellow speakers. Pamela Ma is Executive Vice President of Fung Academy, Fung Group in Hong Kong. And Pamela directs the Academy's research and development activities, which form the base of the group's strategic response to key disruptions in its business operating environment, including technology, geopolitics, and the rise of sustainability. Good morning and welcome, Pamela. I'm glad you made it. <laughs> and to Peter. Peter Armand is the co-founder and CFO of Rugeeks, a pioneering company in cloud telecommunications networking based on shared economy principles. Leadership, Rugeeks developed a unique patented technology of content delivery over a regional networks with poor internet infrastructure, making it possible to watch educational, telemedicine and any other video content in places where it was not possible before with the aim to reduce the digital divide. Prior to founding Rugeeks, Peter was an investment banker and IT technology leader in top global banks and IT companies. Peter is also a patent author in telecommunications. Good morning and welcome Peter. Felix von Schubert has over 20 years of private equity technology investment and operations experience. Felix co-founded InFrontier, a specialist investment company active in post-conflict regions. Felix runs the first and only investment fund in Afghanistan with investments in healthcare, technology and financial services. Previously, he co-founded Zoo Capital, an independent private equity and infrastructure fund manager dedicated to clean tech and renewable energy markets, managing over 600 million euros. He is also co-founder and non-executive chair of New Space Capital, Europe's largest dedicated growth capital investor in space technologies. And good morning, Felix. Lieutenant General Sadir Sharma is chairman of MITCAT Advisory Service. Sadir has handled distinguished leadership and diplomatic assignments, including command of the largest operational force in the world. He has led and modernized the logistics of the 1.3 million strong Indian Army and was India's defense attache in London. Sadir has been on many boards and panels, advisories and governors of large Indian and global corporations. Good morning, Sadir. Thank you. And finally, John is the chairman of Rock Lake Associates, which he founded in 2009 following a successful career in international business and financial services. He hails from Chicago, Milwaukee, and has spent the past 40 years living in Europe. John's prior corporate positions include founder and director of WJ Hopper & Co Limited in London, 
and Director of Business Development at Security Pacific Merchant Bank and Bank of America in Frankfurt. So good morning, John, and welcome all the panel. Nice to have you here this morning. Uh, just to start the discussion, I would like to first come to Pamela. Um, so I know that we share a great passion for social impact, and I would like to talk about the products and supply chain. So for long-term environmental sustainability, could one of our major focuses be on the supply chain improvements, Pamela? You're still on mute. Okay, so um, thank you, Angela. It's a delight. it's a great to uh, be here. I think the um, the issue of uh, short and long term really um, comes to uh, comes to roost in supply chains that are attempting to be more sustainable from a social and environmental perspective. And the key issue is that those who a um, i.e. invest in social inclusion and environmental sustainability may not actually be the ones to reap the rewards. So um, I'm not blaming quarterly reporting. What I'm blaming is a system where, uh, where people aren't forced to pay the future costs of their decisions today. Um, it's about carbon pricing, it's about um, economic impacts uh, that are borne out in society. And uh, we as an industry um, and as a business community need to find ways to basically uh, incentivize or create the right incentives for uh, those who have the levers of power um, to uh, to gain from the decisions that they could make. Some of those, uh, so carbon pricing is one. Two is simple um, enforcing of um, environmental responsibility. Uh, three is to promote forms of economic upgrading and value chain um, upgrading in ways that would bring the workers along and teach them new skills. And that last element is becoming even more important today because we're basically moving into the digital age. So we've got basically consumer product supply chain, which are labor intensive, they're very um, menial uh, and you know based on mass production. And you've got workers who need to actually be brought into the era of automation and digital and the digital economy. And we have the very means to do that, except that the incentives are sort of all wrong. Um, and so I think that is, that is where um, business and government can really work together to understand how policy frameworks trickle down and have impact in business decisions. So I think that's a real opportunity for Asia especially because we are where the decisions about job creation, about automation, and about where to put growth and what type of growth we're going to have in the post you know, mass manufacturing age, that's where we're gonna be making the decisions. And so we have an opportunity to actually create the industry, which is digital ready, which actually benefits the people who are currently employed. And that's not something that the US was able to do successfully. Um, Europe is having uh, is having issues, but they, they are at least making the right decisions. But Asia is really where you're gonna see the people impact really in Technicolor. So I think that's um, that's one of the key issues for Asia's future uh, today, and as well for supply chains, which are trying to be more sustainable in response to consumer demand. Thank you, Pamela. And you've touched on so many areas there that I know we're going to be bringing into the discussion today as well. So one of those being the digital and technology side. So, Peter, if I may come to you, do you think technology has the opportunity to close the long and the short term gap? Uh, yeah, I think it definitely can. So uh, we can we can use technology, for example, to, to manage assets in a more sustainable way. And uh, the, the easiest example would be um, it's running a shared economy business. What what I am doing, and and such business models only possible with the help of technology right now. So, for example, sharing economy uh, companies, just, just think about uh, Uber, Airbnb, car sharing companies, uh, to name just a few. And uh, in, in many digitally advanced countries, uh, it is possible for any citizen already to, to rent a bicycle or umbrella with just a few clicks of smartphone, right? So Uber model, as an example of sharing economy business model, it, it, it really changes the balance between long and, and short term goals of a corporation because financially it converts um, 
capex into opex cash flows right and if we think about uh, is it a bad thing or good thing uh, for sustainability for corporate for citizen i think yes but because uh, in a turbulent world uh, very long term planning and long term capital investments may be destructive for sustainability and switching the management view on cash flows onto short term definitely helps so you're talking about um one of the areas of great interest especially for our panel which is this investment side and i find it interesting that when we talk about long long and short term we've all got different views about what time period that is so if i may come to you felix um you you mentioned before actually in an age of increased multiple conditional investment um is quarterly reporting for example considered too slow for the real ch time changes that are required yeah, very good question. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Look, it, it's interesting, you know, you hear a lot of um, people saying, oh, three monthly um, reporting is a problem and it's too short term. And, you know, my comment tends to be, look, if I haven't heard from my companies within a couple of days uh, um, of, you know, something happening, then there's a problem. You know, if I don't know what's going on within, you know, at least weekly, then, then I feel nervous. And that's not just due to the fact that we're investing in obviously a very tricky market, uh, Afghanistan and, and, and similarly uh, difficult uh, um, frontier markets, but it's the nature of young and growing companies that need you know, very close, not just supervision, but also support on a continuous basis. So I, I feel nervous when I don't, don't, uh, don't hear. Having said that, um, we are also, as, as an investment firm, looking at the, at the long term. So among our, <clears throat> among our investment metrics, outside of the usual financial metrics and, uh, and very various ESG metrics that we're measuring on a continuous basis across the portfolio and in each company, we're looking at what is the impact of an investment that we make on the entire sector. So we're trying to measure if we make an investment in an insurance company, which we have made um, a couple of years ago, what's the impact on the insurance sector? What's the impact on the number of reinsurance firms willing to go to a country like Afghanistan? What's the impact on the regulator? How has the regulator improved in its own abilities? So, you know, that obviously is a much more long-term strategy. But in order to build successful companies, in any environment, but particularly in a difficult environment like a frontier market, it's really important to be very, very close to the companies <coughs> day in and day out. And one of the areas that uh, both Peter and Pamela have touched on is that localized uh, connection, learning and development of the communities. And I know when you've been talking about investments previously, uh, you've had a focus on localized entrepreneurial projects so that the impact, uh, especially on short term, is, is seen within local communities. Could you tell us a little bit about that, Felix? Yeah, very much so. And look, <clears throat> in frontier markets, quite often, you know, either through conflict, through wars, through various other uh, um, sort of events, um, an inherent entrepreneurial culture has disappeared or has at least not been as active anymore uh, as previously. So what we're doing is trying to foster sort of the entrepreneurship side of things. So we're giving classes in local universities uh, within their sort of entrepreneurship uh, sort of activities. Um, we're supporting various founder networks that have never existed previously just to create an ecosystem among uh, 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 like-minded uh, and usually quite young entrepreneurs. We make sure that our CEOs meet together, our CFOs meet together, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. So we're really trying to create a, a, an investment culture and a culture of how to create fast-moving uh, and well-organized uh, and governed uh, companies in a country like Afghanistan. <coughs> and it, it, it's really surprising to see the, 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 the ripple effects of that. You know, you suddenly hear other companies saying, hey, I've heard you've yeah. done this, this is how you do that. And, you know, you suddenly create that, that buzz, um, which is what uh, this is all about. So you're seeing quite a lot of collaboration on the ground then? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of collaboration on the ground, not just between our companies, but you know, within the sector, um, we're seeing um, 
young people suddenly thinking, okay, how can I start my own business? Do I need capital? Where do I get the capital from? You know, it, it's a different mindset from the mindset that unfortunately has established over time of, okay, where can I get my next uh, grant money from? Where can I get some free money from? And that's an area we're really trying to replace. We're trying to see how can one develop a country like Afghanistan with the means of a commercial investment focus versus companies that are just there to focus on what's my next milestone for a, a random grant program. We are all about sustainability. How can we create sustainable companies that are profitable, creating jobs, creating tax revenue eventually, and developing sectors? That's what we think is so critical when you look at international aid. I think the area that you touched on about mindset is utterly important because uh, within the UK, we have um, fantastic funders across the country that are able to um, uh, fund projects throughout the very multiply deprived communities but of course because of the money um, coming through funding it's very short term mm -hmm. so sustainability is one of the biggest challenges that we have in that model so a different mindset is utterly important talking about young people and entrepreneurial investment john i'd like to come to you because i understand that you're involved in a number of these types of projects would you like to explain more uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to share my experience. I've enjoyed this uh, session so far since seven this morning on, on harassment. I want to thank you and I want to thank Frank and everybody who's doing all the work to make this this uh, day uh, a, a, an amazing day of learning. I always carve it out for my, my learning day out of the year. Um, uh, so I'm invested in startups in, in India. I'm, invest, I'm invested in, and involved with uh, growth equity companies and uh, large funds. And I'm on the board of uh, an infrastructure investment company in, in Qatar, which is investing in infrastructure in Africa and, and Asia. So I sort of feel like I see the gamut and, uh, from startups to large, well-established companies. And I've been working with private equity firms and investors and LPs for on close to 30 years. Um, I think that there is no right answer to the questions that are being posed here. I think that it all depends. Uh, it's like when my daughter comes to me and says, what about this or that? I say, well, it depends. It depends on what your perspective is. And I appreciate everything that Pamela said uh, coming from her, her perch. Uh, and it's, it's about alignment of interests. Um, and I completely agree with Felix that, uh, you know, when, when I see the headline that says, Quarterly, quarterly reporting is way too, too short-termism, uh, and we need to get into longer-term planning. Well, yes, but it depends on which perch you're sitting in. If you're an investor, you want to get almost daily updates on exactly what's happening, and it's about, it's about decisions that are being made uh, day by day or hour by hour by the people who are, who are managing your money. Uh, if you're, if you're, uh, your perspective is as an investor in companies, and you have somebody who says, I'd like to get back to you once a year and tell you what's going on, or maybe in five years, because that's long-term planning. Excuse me, you're not going to have a dollar of my investment portfolio. <coughs> um, also, I think talking about the impact of technology, um, the, uh, the ability, if, they, if you have the, the resources in a company to be able to manage the information flow and wh where are you with your inventory and your supply chain and your debt, on your books and uh, uh, your customers and your revenue and uh, your workforce deployment, uh, you are able to give almost daily reporting on where things stand in your company. And if you're a large investor, you want to know, and you have people in your team that are that are assigned specifically to watch that investment and tell them through through technology, are they making good decisions or bad decisions day by day? So I, you know, I, and, but then again, if you're in, a, in the, uh, if you're sitting in a political seat and you're making decisions uh, uh, that have wide ranging implications to be able to hit your mark five years and 10 years down the road, then you definitely want to have much, much longer term horizons. So again, it's, it's your perspective. It's your, it's, it's where you're coming from. There's no right answers. And it's about, it's about trying to uh, strike alignment, uh, again, as Pam has said, that the people who are making the decisions and investing the money uh, uh, are responsible and held accountable for the decisions that are, that are taken today, <clears throat> what, what kind of gasoline or energy they're consuming and what kind of transportation they're using 
and what they're investing in for the short term and the long term. So the, the short term and long term gap is a difficult one. Mankind has been trying to achieve that balance for, for, for thousands of years. Uh, and uh, so we, 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 I'm sure we haven't gotten there yet and we'll probably never see we'll never see a solution in our lifetime. But education plays a big role to help people on the on the shop floor understand how their role impacts what's happening in the boardroom. So I don't know if that's if, if that's helpful, but it's it's certainly interesting from an uh, operating in the investment management world to uh, hear all everybody's different viewpoints on the, on the topic. I, I think that's wonderful. Thank you, John, for sharing that because it really ties in with something I was discussing with Sadia uh, recently about short term being the small steps of the long term strategy. So I'd like to come to you, Sadia, because with your vast experience of, shall we call it team, uh, what is it, 1.3 million people, um, this information flow that John talked about, this open communication, I think is one of the crucial things. And I know that Peter and Pamela have also talked about how understanding within team enables the gap to come closer. Would you like to comment there, Sadia? <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, listening to my co-panelists and lots of good knowledge I've learned today. But uh, to coming to the basic premise, I, I personally feel, sitting from India, that there is really no essential dichotomy between short-termism and long-termism. With the kind of technology which has come to the fore today, which, which you talked about, there is so much that we can do where both can really move hand in hand. And we are talking about quarterly reporting, we are talking about daily reporting, we are talking about weekly reporting, yet keeping a clear focus on the long-term vision and the need for long-term investment, how to go to companies. Uh, I'll particularly talk about the example of India. We've got a huge number of new startups which are coming to it, technology startups in India. They are showing no profits in the quarterly basis, but they're garnering a huge amount of money into the long-term money, and people are investing in them heavily because they believe in the long-term future, despite the short terms being what they are. So I'm thank you. What I'm trying to bring across is with the digital economy, the way it is going through, we are able to bridge this gap between looking at the short term, uh, what's happening every day, and yet keep a clear focus on what can take place in the future. I'd also like to take a point from what uh, Pamela said. Yes, I think sustainable growth and sustainable, you know, vision is required for the complete supply chain. Without a sustainable and a you know a responsible vision for a supply chain, we'll not be able to make any progress. And a country like India, I like the term which they call frontier markets. Yes, India is some kind of a frontier market where lots of young entrepreneurs with a very low money threshold invest into small small businesses to try to become small entrepreneurs, take on franchises. We need to hold their hands by keeping that link through technology with them and give them information on a daily basis. What they earn on a daily basis is what really makes them understand what will happen. Even a weekly you know, cash payout is looking small for them. So I think we have reached a stage where we're coming even shorter term, yet keeping a long-term vision going. And that is the way for the economy to build for the future. But we've got to build a trust portion. With that. And that is a very important part of it. And I feel that uh, we in India have got one little problem that most of our promoters, our businesses are run by promoters who hold major stock holding. And that creates the feeling that we don't get enough you know, disclosure. So we need a lot of disclosure for these small investors. And in India, very, very small investors to get a confidence that they're part of the whole decision making process and they're getting information at the fingertips as the company is going. So this is the way I look at it. I am biased towards uh, short term and I'm biased even to more uh, detailed reporting, more information flow so that everybody can understand what exactly is happening. And it's the role of the managers and the leaders to ensure that they do not lose sight of the long-term vision, they do not lose sight of the strategic vision of the company, yet keep everybody informed of how things are progressing in a very, very open, transparent, and a fair manner. That's how businesses can grow all over the world. Thank you. So, Thank uh, you, Sadia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, John, come in. Angela, I was just going to say, it's very interesting because we had a challenge question put to us for the, for the panel by Frank which was the problem that short-termism is creating uh, to disallow us to reach long-term sustainable goals. And yet I hear some consensus on the panel that maybe from the investor's perspective, shorter, even shorter-term reporting is required and it's possible. 
I think this thing about time frame, as you were saying, John, it depends on where you're standing and what you're involved with. So I think the one on one on economics is about trade offs. And it's interesting that time is also coming in within that. Um, for instance, if we start talking about the, the climate, you know, I know that through COVID, a lot of people have been saying, pull your money out of investments. It's dying. The markets are, are really struggling. But having spoken to Felix previously, you mentioned that through COVID, the, the investment risk that everybody has been speaking about has been low with your, your investments. Would you like to share some details about that, Felix? Yeah, it's interesting, actually, obviously, we were quite nervous because in a country like Afghanistan and similar markets <clears throat> are just not prepared for COVID. Uh, in Afghanistan, they've got one facility able to treat COVID patients with about 30 beds. That's it for a country of 35 million. Not a, a pretty starting point. Um, fortunately, um, the country seems to be OK generally, but also the portfolio is OK. And that's interesting. So. Our um, uh, insurance company that we own in, in Afghanistan uh, is the first to have ever started uh, offering health insurance, initially for corporate uh, uh, clients uh, and all of their employees. Um, and this year alone, we grew with over 400% in number of health insured individuals. Uh, and that's interesting. Now, COVID, you can't really cover COVID because there isn't that much to cover and there's no treatment. You, know, you can cover the, the hospital cost, but not much more. Um, but still, it made people aware that health insurance is really important. So that company did incredibly well uh, over the last uh, six months. But also our technology company. So we own a company that has the, the largest data center in the country. Um, suddenly people realize, hmm, I need to check wh where my data is. I need to make sure I've got proper backup solutions in place. I need to move into the you know sort of 21st century from a technology point of view in a country like Afghanistan. That was uh, an eye-opener as well, and a lot of new clients uh, came to us. And I think there's opportunity uh, in this crisis. Obviously, you just need to check all of those um, uh, sort of Amazon look-alike companies and their share prices. You realize there's opportunity. Uh, but even in an early-stage market, um, you can find your niches and you can really support uh, uh, larger uh, companies uh, to, to develop. I think with um, John, would you like to come in there because of your financial investing in the way that you've been developing through the COVID epidemic? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that uh, I think Felix is right. Uh, um, you know, there's so many things going on um, that uh, and, and, and COVID has really sort of like uh, the, the tide has gone out and uh, those who are who are strong and have sustainable business models and, and provide something which the population or the customers need will still be there even even through COVID. Um, you know, all, all the companies that I'm involved in in India are still thriving because they're digital companies and they're in fact growing their business. I'm involved in a life insurance company in Australia, a digital life insurance company, which is the only online life provider in Australia. They're gaining market share through COVID while the rest of the market is actually shrinking because of the way life insurance is, so, is typically sold, which is sort of door to door, you know, the old, the old model. So uh, people are saying, the agents are saying, well, where, how can I possibly get insurance for my customers if you're an IFA? And uh, it is, they, they turn to the screens. That's the only place I can get. And so as to what Pamela was saying, you know, supply chain and, uh, it's all going, it's all, if you're not, if you're selling furniture or you're, whatever it is that you're, that you're marketing, if you're not online, you're not going to be able to, to, uh, to, to survive uh, in, through COVID. No matter how much money you continue throwing. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, sorry, John. I, it was just a really, really interesting point about being online because um, one of the areas that Peter's been working in is about the, the poor infrastructure that's out there across so many of the countries. So how yeah. do we help to develop the um, infrastructure and the connectivity? Even in Scotland, we have rural communities that are really struggling to get online. Uh, so, Peter, would you like to come in there? Uh, yeah, definitely. That's a problem. And uh, about only about a half of the world population has a broadband internet connection right now, and that's a definitely a technology limitation for developing, right, and for for avoiding the new black swans like COVID. 
So, yeah, definitely online will help. And online companies uh, are thriving right now and developing their costs, including our company. Uh, so regarding the, the COVID um, and, and similar similar black swans, uh, as I heard in, in, in one recent joke about that, if COVID virus would write a CV for searching a new job, it would write uh, the following statement there, like, I have highlighted and demonstrated the importance of governance, adaptability, and long-term planning, and developing that understanding across all sectors. In some okay. cases, post-mortem. That's good. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and Pamela, I believe you want to this point as well. Yeah, so um, can, can you all hear me all right? Yeah, okay. So what, what I wanted to say is that I think the bigger risk is not really in the present, um, but that what COVID has done is really accelerate the economy's uh, shift to digital. And that's not only on the retail and consumers, um, but also for supply chains. I mean, uh, now we're doing all digital design, digital sampling, digital uh, remote inspections and so on. And as more and more firms switch to a more digital mindset, I think we're going to find that the difference between well-educated people and people who are educated in a more rote um, kind of basic type of education, which is more prevalent in the developing world, um, that they're going to be at a disadvantage. So um, the question is, how are we going to bring up, how, first, how are we going to change the education system? Okay, but, you know, more urgently is that as this group of laborers, um, and don't forget, you know, we got to create, you know, millions of jobs in Africa and India just because of the population, the shape of the population, is that if the education system isn't educating these people for an economy where innovation, critical thinking, creativity, and ability to, you know, crunch data in ways that, um, you know, STEM skills, and if the economy is, is valorizing those skills, but we're not educating people to do that, that's going to create a huge disadvantage and the wealth gap is just going to is just going to go up. So what do we do now? Because this is going to be a problem for the next two decades. Right. And so how do we make sure that the president workers is able to go, you know, we're able to bring them along and then prepare the next generation of workers to be really what our economy is shifting to. You know, we have this phrase, um, you know, you skate to where the puck is. I don't see education systems actually adapting fast enough. So I'm really worried for, you know, all of my compatriots in Asia that we're not educating them in the way needed. And it's not only, you know, what we're teaching them, but also how, you know, how are we, you know, moving online? How are we using bite-sized learning, mobile learning? Um, those are all things that people can adapt to, but I just think we need to, we just need to be doing it a lot faster. And I think there's a lot of money in this. So for investors, it's going to be, you know, health services and education. Those are the two, you know, kind of things that I wish there was more money going into, especially in developing countries. I think you've touched on so many of the points here, and, and I think at the core of this, we're talking about a mindset, a complete and utter shift in the way that we're viewing things, because COVID and the pandemic has brought out this fragility. And if we're going to be working on education mindset changes, uh, and we're talking intergenerational for the communities, um, it goes on for decades and decades, as you say, how on earth do we bring this gap closer together now? What are the ways that we can combat this now? Because a lot of what we're talking about that's needed is long term. And how do we position ourselves in this situation? So, for instance, with the leadership that we need to talk about, um, are we talking we need to be so much more courageous? Um, for instance, within the UK, as soon as finances get on the tight side, creativity is cut. But it doesn't seem to be linked to the innovation, because if we talk innovation, then we're talking risk and people don't want to fund or invest in risk. So it, it sort of goes round in a really challenging situation. So how do we do something now? What's our next step? Let me come to you, Felix. I knew you would come to me on this one. <laughs> 
it, this is one Thank of you. the most <laughs> crucial. Uh, this is one of the most crucial questions, and obviously every country and every uh, um, in a situation is different. But I have to agree with Pamela. Education is absolutely crucial. And guess what? We just created an entire generation that is missing nine months of schooling. Afghanistan is a good example. Schools have been shut since 1st of March and just reopened in, in part. And the problem is in a country like Afghanistan, there is just nothing. People then, you know, kids are then on, on, uh, on the streets, behaving, misbehaving, working for the parents, whatever they're doing. But they're still not learning to read and write or, or do anything else. And that's a real issue. So I think the long-term effects of what we've just experienced is going to be drastic, particularly in the developing world. And yes, in the UK, at least some schools managed to, to be online and provide schooling. Many, even in the UK, did not manage to do that. So I think we've got a much bigger issue on our hands than we actually expected at the beginning of the pandemic. But even without a pandemic, education is so crucial. So we just invested in, in one of the top um, uh, schools in Afghanistan and to create secondary education with the right environment. So we're, we're invested in order to build a, a much bigger new campus to allow many more children to attend, to allow uh, also any children with disabilities to be able to, to attend. Uh, so creating that framework, that environment, we think is, is critical. But obviously, you know, it's, it's one small drop in a big, big ocean uh, in a country like Afghanistan. And the same is true in many other countries. So I think focusing on the education uh, across the board is incredibly important. And if we miss the boat, particularly if we don't manage to catch up the last 10 months, it's going to haunt us for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very yeah. well put, Felix. I would say something. I, I found it very interesting when uh, Pamela and Felix talk about education. I, I think there's no denying that it's one of the most crucial things that we are facing to in India. We're talking about upskilling our population, but I see a silver lining in this, especially as far as India is concerned. A silver lining is that COVID has in fact taught us that online education is actually possible. I also was not a big believer that online education in schools was possible, but I must tell you with great delight that 90% of Indian schools have functioned throughout the COVID at 90% attendance. All schools have gone online, most of the schools. And as we learned that online teaching is possible, the government and state governments and people have geared up and set up online teaching forums and a huge number of online classes to raise the build up. And I find that my children and all children all over India are not getting involved in using that. And internet connectivity, India hitting 700 million and really holding a smartphone. I think a time has come now to look at education from a digital perspective. And we can stop this uh, brick and mortar plus digital and therefore transform our full education system to take advantage of the learnings of COVID and become totally an online education platform using the different languages required in India. In fact, 30 languages are required to put on the best. And we are laying fiber optics. And I'm, I'm hopeful in the next five years, we will trans transition to online digital schooling system by which lots and lots of people can be brought on board, upskilled, so that they can look for jobs, which are, you know, what Pamela said, the job creation market is very important with so many million youth coming to the market. It's going to be a huge problem to deal with it. And that is something I think I feel COVID has taught us that we can survive remotely and digitally if we are able to harness our resources well. And that's what we should do. Thank you. I'd like to add uh, yeah. that. Yeah. Um, Sudhir, I think uh, you, you bring up a good point, um, but there's obviously, I think it, it exposes the, 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 the utility or the functionality of schooling. And, and you've got to separate schooling from education. Because one of the things that a lot of parents say is, oh, I've got to get my kids and, and, edu and, and uh, professionals in the education world say so you've got to get the kids back into school because that's where they're going to get socialization and they're going to learn and their learning journey is going to continue at a better pace. But if you break it down uh, into components, uh, you could say that we could use technology uh, for, for the actual academic learning component of what they get in a school. And maybe the whole model changes where the socialization aspect of what kids get in learning sort of goes back to the neighborhood so that there are socialization events and programs that are that are created in the new in the new covid or post covid world where they get some let's say the afternoon times are spent with neighborhood uh programs and learning maybe by hand making baskets or working on whatever 
but the morning session is spent on screens. So they get the, they get both worlds and you're not losing out. I mean, if we move in, if we think about moving into an education world, I'm thinking about grade school, not high school, but the grade school, which is where people are, a lot of focus is coming in. The high school and college people say by that time, students are old enough to be able to do a lot of learning on screen and they've got their socialization skills down. But probably there's a new way to reinvent schooling in a post-COVID environment, so you still get the, the components that they need, but in a different way. And one of the things, John, <clears throat> that you're touching on there, we've recently done a survey in Clack Manager about what people are needing. So it's all ages have responded. And it's all about interaction. It's all about social connection with learning. And we know that the magic happens in those spaces between people that are willing to share and open. Peter, would you like to come in here? Um, yeah, yeah. Regarding education, I, I totally agree with John. Um, and uh, digitization of education definitely brings very much value. But education itself must must change to adapt to to the new reality and new world and and new uh, COVID pandemics or new black swans. And there is a definite need for programs like educate the educator. And there is a there is a huge program in the World Bank about that, for example. And what what we do in our company is uh, we do a mobile application um, kind of education for medical doctors, right, who are spreading the knowledge on on how to behave in the pandemic uh, and so on and so on. And this is what we can do. So that's a kind of a leverage for education. So you first educate the educators, and then they're spreading the the, the knowledge uh, with the new technology as well. Yeah. This is really getting interesting, and we're running out of time, isn't it? Uh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Felix, let's go to you first. Look, thinking back to the topic, long and short termism, there's nothing more long term than education, and that's what we need to remember. Um, at the same time, you know, daily action, weekly action in order to change system, to change whatever's happening with an investment is required. So it's important to keep a long, uh, long term perspective. And it's important to figure out how to measure that. What is your impact metric? How do you find the system to make it comparable? That's what we're trying to, to develop with our whole sector impact. But that's going to be the crux if we can figure out how to measure that impact and then judge ourselves by that. And Pamela, would you like to come in here because you started this section of the conversation? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, um, I was reflecting on You're everything. You're still unmuted, that we Pamela, if you just unmute yourself. So <laughs> I'm unmuted. We can, okay. I hear you. So um, I was just thinking, you, you know, we all mute. agree that we need, we, we need a more sustainable um, economy. And some of us have said that investors can play a part. You know, my own view is that we need to change the incentives faced by uh, corporate managers. Um, we've also mentioned education and the need for mindset change um, and the way we educate people. I think the, the fourth element is um, what I would call courage, because the thing is, the incentives and the policy framework will never be right. OK, there will always be something missing. And that's just because the goalposts keep moving. Right? It always becomes that we have to do more. And so for us individually, we all have choices every day. And so I think we need to, um, on a regular basis, ask us, are we being courageous in taking that first step? And because it's going to be iterative, you know, we are going to step, another of our collaborators is going to step, even our competitors is going to step. And so we need to sort of drive that change every single day and not wait for what we think is going to be the thing to unblock the whole system. There is not one thing. There's so many aspects. And so I think we just need to uh, make it like a personal thing um, to uh, every day. What are we doing in order to make the system better? So love to hear your reaction. Yeah. Lovely. Could, I John, say, uh, to finish. could I say I think we need to end this session? Because the yeah. next one is starting in 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Pamela, for summarizing the discussion that we've been having this morning. And Felix, John, Peter, Sadia, Pamela, thank you so much for joining the panel. I've really enjoyed it and I felt we were really starting to get into a really good discussion there. Um, but hopefully um, 
I'll see you throughout the rest of the Harasses Day. Thank you to Frank, Jürgen, Richter for bringing everybody together and creating these opportunities. It's been wonderful this morning. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Angela. Especially with you for looking after so well and Bye. doing it so well. well thank you, Angela. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.